Welcome to our posts today, we will see stories of r slash malicious compliance. I can go to the concert, but my sister has to go with. Okay, that's fine. It was going to be my first concert. I was 16, Bon Jovi and Skid Row. There were so many people wanting to go that you had to get a line pass to even get in the line for tickets. I was being allowed to go with my two best friends, which was a big deal, as I wasn't allowed to do anything, ever. This was going to be huge. At the last minute, literally on the way to the line, I'm told, your sister, her husband and your little sister are going with you can't be serious, and you can take it or leave it. Well alright then. Me and my two besties were dropped off to join the line and I was given money for four tickets to cover all of my family's tickets. At some point during this long wait it occurs to us that we'll all have to sit in our assigned seats and neither I nor my friends want to hang out with my old sister her old husband funny. Looking back, how 25 seemed ancient and little sister who honestly should not have been going in the first place. Malicious Compliance I get to the counter and ask for three tickets please. Complete the transaction. And then three more tickets please, as far away from the first three as you can get them. The cashier totally knew what was up and gave me three more on the complete other side of the arena. We never mentioned it and pretended to realize ah what a bummer on the way to the show. They knew it was no coincidence but there was nothing to be done at that point. We rocked out like crazy people, and I even got a t-shirt. Good times were had by some. Next story. The bar said patrons only want the jukebox, so I complied. I went to a local bar today to watch the College World Series final. Bartender says they can't play the sound for the game because more patrons want to play the jukebox than watch the game. There are about 12 people in the bar total, including my party of four. This seems silly, seeing as how it's a sports bar and there aren't any other major sporting events occurring at the same time as this game. I decide that since the patrons want the jukebox, the jukebox is what they'll get. I queue up the cotton-eyed Joe by rednecks six times in a row and pay the extra to bump it to the front of the queue. After the first playthrough, the jukebox skips to a different song. We call the manager over. Ask him to refund our jukebox money since he won't play our song, and he says he'd rather listen to Cotton-Eyed Joe six times than refund the money. He comes back a few minutes later, hands us $13 cash to cover the songs and turns on the sound for the baseball game. Turns out his patrons didn't want to listen to the jukebox that badly after all. Next story. That time Karen tried to bully another mom and got an eyeful. I 33F unexpectedly gave birth two months earlier than my due date. Thankfully baby and I are doing great and we've now made it home. As you can imagine, coming that early meant baby needed a rather long stay in the infant spa NICU. Now that we're home and I've been able to process everything I wanted to share a moment of malicious compliance that helped bring some levity to a really scary experience. One of the most important things for a baby, especially preemies, is skin-to-skin -skin time, which is where mothers or fathers will be either topless or open their shirts to cuddle their infant. Baby struggled with jaundice, so our skin-to-skin -skin time was very limited at first because of light therapy. We had been moved to a new location in the NICU right next to another baby and across from two others. A standard of care in the NICU is monitoring the baby's breathing, heart rate, and oxygen levels. These monitors look like an old-school tube TV and are approximately 16 inches by 16 inches and can display babies in other areas as well if the nurses need. So I'm new to this little care area, and I'm getting ready to set up the hospital-provided screen so I can get my skin-to-skin -skin time, but realize I may end up blocking the monitor for the baby next to me from the nurse. I asked the nurse if she can still see or if my setup was blocking anything for her obviously. I don't want to interfere with the care of another patient. She tells me everything was good, so I settle in for some much needed snuggles. Not even 10 minutes later I feel someone in my space and look up to see a woman glaring down at me. Once I've made eye contact Karen starts in on me while topless and holding baby. 
so very vulnerable about how I'm blocking the nurse from caring for her baby. When I try to explain I ask before setting things up. She refuses to listen and continues to lecture and gets more aggressive and angry about how I'm causing her baby not to receive appropriate care and am pushing her out of the care area. After all the emotional stress and frustration of being in the hospital, I finally snapped, looked at the nurse and told her to take away the screen. The nurse was horrified and started saying, but your privacy, to which I replied firmly, it would seem my privacy and modesty don't matter as much as Karen's comfort, get rid of the screen. This pissed off Karen even more as she realized she'd have to spend the next hour staring at my topless self. She got very annoyed and uncomfortable, especially when the doctors managing rounds and both got flustered and tried to insist I get a new screen. I may have been the awe, but I simply was done and stared right back and said, according to my neighbor here, my privacy doesn't matter, so we all get to be uncomfortable. When I tell you, if looks could kill, I'd be dead, I'm not joking. The doctors didn't want to deal with it, and the nurses who had to deal with it were laughing quite a bit. They then brought the screen back out and tried to show Karen that they can totally see all her baby's stats on any monitor, so there was no reason for this outburst. I wish I could say this was the last time she freaked out about this, but she pulled this same kind of stunt almost every time I tried to snuggle my baby, until her baby was finally discharged a week later. But seeing the look of shock on her face when I just forced everyone to look at my boobs is probably going to make me giggle every time I think of it. Next story. Principal told me to instruct courses I was not trained to teach or look for another job, so I did. I've been teaching for six years, at my last school for two years. I have a BA in history and MA in education. My principal and administrative staff pulled me out of one of my classes during an intense lecture I was giving and ambushed me in the hallway to ask tell me I was going to teach IB classes next year. For those unaware, international baccalaureate courses are intense classes for high school students that last from one to two years. These classes are intense, requiring what some teachers have said to be the time equivalent of a part-time job for them to plan and prepare, without additional pay and not part of my contract. For context, within the first two weeks of working at this school, I noticed the other side of the pendulum. The students with learning challenges were being pushed aside in order to achieve the principal's goals of becoming an elite IB school. I began advocating for these students and offered to teach co-taught class with a special education teacher in order to help these students achieve. It was a great success, seeing many of the former troubled students actively being engaged in class, and through the grapevine, I was told I was one of their favorite teachers since I got them. After the first semester, I heavily petitioned the staff to allow me to teach more of these specialized classes across my department. Here's the deal, there was no change in the curriculum, just in how I presented it to the shared class. Anyhow, the principal shot down my idea, but allowed me to continue with my lone class for the next year. Back to the present. After the ambush, I went home and talked it over with my wife. She is my rock, and understood that I was troubled with the additional task of basically adding an additional 15 hours of work a week to my schedule. She said, go with your heart. The next week I scheduled a meeting with the principal. I told him I was unprepared to teach the IB course this year, but if he would give me this year to prepare the additional materials and create a curriculum, I would be good to go for the next. I also asked if there were any other additional classes he would like for me to put together to teach next year. He said, no, teach this course next year or look for another job. I asked about additional co-taught courses for the shared students who were overlooked. He said they were not important. I reminded him, yet again, I was currently working toward my PhD in history, in order to teach college-level courses in high school, so students could get dual credit and a jump on college and tech schools. He laughed at me and said, I quote, None of the additional education you have taken since you started working here benefits the school at all. No one cares. This took the wind out of me. I love teaching. All of the additional work 
Time and effort spent away from my family has been in order to be a better teacher, a better example for my students. I told him I would need to think about this and quietly left the room. I took the next day off, spending time with my family and speaking with my therapist. I am very lucky to have a wonderful support system. I went back to work after that, and there were a number of staff that spoke to me privately. They agreed what he said was shameful. They shared that I was not the only teacher he spoke to this way. From changing failing grades to passing, to having teachers sponsor multiple extracurricular clubs without pay. I went to my union rep and added my statement to his ever-growing pile of staff statements about the principal. I assured him I was willing to go to the school board, etc. Just give me a call. Yep, I decided I was done. I wrote the principal an outstanding resignation letter, full of positivity and thanking him for the wonderful opportunity to work at his school and to have learned from his outstanding example of leadership. Did I also mention I forwarded the email to the entire staff? There was no way he could publicly respond negatively to my resignation, and he was furious. The majority of the staff knew what was going on. There were many smiles and fist bumps. I was told by the office staff later there were five other teachers that resigned, making this the biggest turnover in staff in a decade. The principal now has to go before the school board next month to explain what is happening at his school. I wonder if I am going to get a call. Next story. Sure, everyone can come in. Friend of mine, who will call Buddy said I could share this. Background. Buddy worked for a company that got on the hybrid work from home train early. He got his job around 2012. These events take place around 2016. We live in NJ, and his office was in Nick. His contract said that he had to be in one day, a week same day each week, and up to five days a month so one additional day on top of his weekly day. If work brought him in more than that, he got paid his hourly billable rate for his commute and any extra hours. His commute was 1.52 hours each way, so that could quickly add up to hundreds or thousands of hours. Other than a couple of full-time and office folks, his co-workers had similar contracts and had to be in one eight times a month and some lived as far away as Boston or DC. They worked in a well-paid niche consulting field, so I guess this was worth it to everyone. On to the story. Buddy's company has a client who is very old school and their point of contact is a jerk. On a video call, the client notices that some staff do not appear to be in the office before Blur was as common and demands that all of the work done for their contract be done in an office, rants about professionalism. Buddy's manager simply says, okay. Manager calls a meeting afterwards with Buddy's team. He knows they're upset, but asks them to prepare to come into the office daily for the next four, six weeks. Tells them to keep very careful track of receipts, costs, time, etc., and asks them to trust him. For the people who live further away, tells them he'll help set up accommodations for them and their families if necessary. Because the company treats people well, everyone goes along with it with minor grumbling. About five weeks go by, everyone is coming in daily. Remember when I said that most people didn't come in? So yeah, not much space in the office. The company liked teleworking because it allowed them to have a Nick headquarters, but not much space. Everyone keeps careful track of commuting costs, etc., time, and is getting reimbursed for their travel time and everything they are owed. This includes some folks who had contracts that covered lodging if they had to come in more than a day or two in a row. Then one day the manager tells them they can go back to their regular schedule. Everyone notices jerk client is gone, but that the client company is still their client. Later on, Buddy finds out what happened. As per the terms of the contract, the client had to pay for all of that overage. Frustrating for the employees, but Buddy said no one was too mad knowing that it was temporary. Buddy's manager also knew that the same jerk point of contact had been a jerk. He had apparently gotten tired of being asked to sign contract modifications. Buddy said usually these were set at modifications over $1k or something, but this guy had thought these sign-offs were below him, and so set that threshold much higher something like $100k. Due to the wording of the contract, 
This was $100k per change, not total. So, in the five weeks that everyone was coming in full time, he had managed to cost his company a few hundred thousand dollars, but since each individual employee was a single change, no one noticed until the next billing cycle. Jerk got called out by his own company, and they tried to contest the payment. Turns out the contract was very clearly written and the client had to pay. On top of that, this is a pretty niche field, and so the client didn't really have many other options if they wanted to change consultants at that point. Jerk point of contact got fired, and, according to Buddy's manager, couldn't really find work in their smallish field. Buddy and his co-workers got a nice chunk of money. Next story. Casual dress day. I worked for a large religious-based not-for-profit for five years. Despite not praising God I was too good at the job to be fired the GM tried, but it was clear I had no career there. And that freed me from the fear of making a career-limiting choice. In their infinite wisdom and grace, they decided we could have casual dress day once a month for a gold coin donation, which you had to make even if you didn't come in casual dress. For the first one, they made a huge deal about what a big deal this was. They announced the phones and internet access would be cut at midday, and we were all going to clean the office so wear your comfiest clothes. Perfect, I turned up in fleecy pajamas, dressing gown, slippers and a hot water bottle with wool cover tucked under my arm. HR swarmed me and I pointed out these were my comfiest clothes. One of my greatest achievements is having HR formally change the casual dress policy on the first day of its implementation to specifically exclude sleepwear. They formed an official fun committee. They tried to get me to join the fun committee and I flat out refused. After the first casual dress day, they invited another charity to speak at lunch and gave them the donation money. So when they had someone talking about mental health, they had a theme of crazy very tasteful and sympathetic. They gave a prize to someone who wore a hat with eyes on it and someone who wore odd socks. I hired a cow costume and came as a mad cow. I didn't get a prize. I kind of miss having a job where I just didn't care anymore. I hope you guys like this video if you did make sure like, comment, share and subscribe the channel our posts.